When, 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 he, when David first asked me to come out and speak, I, we, we really kind of debated what to talk about. Um, I, I, I've, I've done what I do in some form for about 30 years now. And I know it's hard to believe that I was eight years old when I enlisted, but it's true, <laughs> really. Um, how many of you really believe your government's out to protect you? I mean, the question. All right, well, a couple of folks, that's good. I'll talk to you later. Um, one of the things that's been notable over the, the past, I think, our lifetimes, and, you know, all of us, have been around for a day or two. Um, we've seen a lot of change in the world. Um, I, uh, I actually debated, you're going to laugh at this probably, uh, on John Stossel's Stossel show I debated uh, Representative Ron Paul the, the night he um, announced his, his candidacy, candidacy for presidency. And um, in this debate between him and I, we talked about national defense policy. Um, he clearly uh, disagrees with me on a lot of things. I, I'm fundamentally, let me say it right up front, I'm a conservative. But my think tank, Center for Advanced Defense Studies, really tries to play it down the middle. That's why, as David said, I, can, I will go on Fox News in the morning and I'll talk about something. And I'll go on MSNBC and talk about something. And it's really funny because the think tank will, will call, we'll get calls. We, all, you know, we always do. And, and the calls in the morning, if I'm on Fox, uh, if, I, if I say something bad uh, about what's going on, they, we get complaints that I'm, I'm bashing the Obama White House. Now, I'll go and say the exact same thing with the exact same facts on MSNBC, and we'll get calls complaining that I'm bashing the Bush legacy. <laughs> I, swear, I swear to goodness. And so, and it, it, it really tells you so much of what you see on the air. I mean, people perceive things a certain way. So we really, we really work hard to focus on what the facts, just the facts, man, you know, just the old Joe Friday thing. It's not always easy. So going back to my debate with Ron Paul, um, one of the things I said in this debate, and this is on, you can look on, look on the internet, uh, it's actually on the internet now. Um, he talked about commitment, commitment to defense. And I gotta tell you, when I was coming up, um, I went to high school in Lisbon, Portugal, and then I came back to the States, went to college in Dayton, Ohio, and it was during the Cold War. I really thought, I really thought that my destiny was to die in Germany, fighting the Soviet invasion. I really did. I thought by 2930, I'd be gone. And I lived like that. I was, you know, I was wild. I was, I was a hellion. And then when I figured out the Cold War was over, we won, boy, I had to figure out what to do with the rest of my life. <laughs> so here, here I am, 30 years later. So uh, the point I'm trying to make here is the threat has changed fundamentally. I mean, we kind of knew who the good guys and bad guys were for a long time, right? I mean, Soviets, bad. Us, good. Not so black and white anymore. And this is where we are right now in a very dangerous period of time. And I'm going to talk about some of the threat issues that I've faced, that I'm facing, and then that we all face, and, and what I think is important for us to focus on as a country. Now, I want this to be very interactive. Um, I also am, am touted by my think tank as a special lecturer. A special lecturer, you know what that means? I lecture when I want to. So it, basically, uh, one of the things I'd like to do tonight is have you guys ask questions. Uh, anytime you feel a need that something comes up that you think that you want to go down a path, I'll do that. I'll try to keep us focused on counterterrorism, but I'm going to talk about a lot tonight. And, uh, and again, make, we'll make this very interactive. So, um, let's see, that's all the, uh, let me, you don't mind if I walk around, do you? I hope. Um, Intent-based threat. I, I was talking to some folks over dinner Simply having nuclear weapons and not liking us does not make you a threat. I mean, otherwise, France would be a threat, right? The French, they hate us, right? So not everybody who, who has a weapon who doesn't like us is a threat. How do you discern what the real threats are? Because this is a big planet, and we're, we're not well-liked in a lot of places. So one of the things we've been focusing on is, th is what is the real threat to our, our country? Now, all this stuff, I'm going to, our, our motto is innovation, is, uh, innovation for peace. Uh, and frankly, you know, we're a military think tank, so when we talk in terms of peace, we mean in, ter in terms of how do we defeat the adversary so we have peace. You know, really, when you think about it, it's pretty simple. But, you know, we do sit in D.C., so we have to be kinder and gentler. Um, we do a lot of stuff, and I'm not going to go through everything. We do requirements-driven di data. You know, I, by the way, I've got 35 slides. I'm going to death by PowerPoint tonight. How about that? No, I'm, 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 I won't do that to you. Okay, there's going to be a test tonight before you leave on this. 
No. Basically, all I want you to take away from this, intent. Who really means us harm? Not everybody who hates us can do something about it. They may have the intent, but not the capability. So the first thing to do is look at all these variables. We spend a lot of time looking at stuff, studying stuff. And I'm an operator. Uh, a friend of mine who endorsed my book called me the real Jack Bauer with an intellect. I think it's almost more like the real Forrest Gump because I get to be involved in a lot of interesting stuff. With that said, we, we really do a lot of threat stuff looking at intent. And this is all just stuff that we do. And I'm not, again, I'm not, just, just be aware, you know. Uh, we do a lot of stuff with Horn of Africa. We're looking at piracy. I was on the Bill O'Reilly show talking about piracy when a while back, um, the, remember a while back about uh, six months ago, two couples were murdered by pirates. Well, do you know why? Does anybody, is anybody really, why would pirates do that? Pirates' job is to extract money. Ransom is what they do. Why would they do that? Well, it turned out the reason that, that the couples got killed is because you had a bunch of teenagers who were the pirates. They panicked. They had all these young kids on their teens. And imagine, if you will, your kids. You know, my, I got a 17-year-old in a, a high-stress situation. That's what happened. So, but the press didn't get that. So we, we figured it out, and we, and we talked about that with Bill O'Reilly a little bit. So threats, real versus potential. What is real? What will protect you? What will keep you safe? Uh, root causes, the war on terror. The war on terror, does anybody, that's, that's a politically correct statement. We're not at war with terror. We're at war with radical elements who don't like our way of life, right? Think about it. We're, we're not, terror existed long before we were here. There's a Billy Joel song, we didn't start the fire. Well, we didn't start the terror, it's been there. So we're never going to defeat terror. We've got to be a lot more precise in what huge, huge words we use. Now, I don't agree with the Obama administration's perspective of, well, we want to call it uh, the war on, you know, something. We need to call it for what it is, where it's a war on radical Islam, you know? Uh, that's what it really is. And I, I don't want to offend anybody, but when you think about it, that's what we're really dealing with here. We're dealing with a bunch of folks who fundamentally have a different way of looking at things. Is that better? Okay. So what we, we, we need to do is, is call the sho a shovel a shovel, right? That's the deal. So when we call the war on terror, we really do a disservice to what we're doing. Now, um, before 9-11, let's talk about a little before 9-11, I did something called able danger. Able danger, for what it's worth, just so you all understand, was an anti-terrorism project that focused on al-Qaeda in 1999, run by General Hugh Shelton. General Shelton was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, worked directly for President Clinton. He tasked General Pete Schoomaker, General Schoomaker, Special Operations Command Commander, to, to look at what we can do, we could do, special operations guys, to defeat or preclude Al-Qaeda doing new attacks. Keep in mind, this is 99. We've been hit twice. We've been hit the embassy bombing and there's the, the, the bombings in, in Saudi Arabia. This is before the, the coal was hit. So this was quite groundbreaking. And you all might remember five years ago when I testified, everybody focused on data mining, all the data mining. It wasn't data mining. Special Operations Command does not do data mining. They, for lack of a better term, kill people and break things, right? I mean, so that's what Able Danger was about. And, and this is where the truth becomes important. One of the themes you'll hear me talk about tonight is the truth. What is the truth? Uh, Washington, D.C., it's an interesting place. One of the lessons I've learned over the past five years being there is that in Washington, the truth is negotiable. Now think about that. Think about that. Does that now, do you feel safer? Now, so, now think about that. Now, the politics, and I'll tell you, I'll close with a story about Senator Trent Lott. Remind me if I forget, but Senator Trent Lott and I were in the green room together five years ago, and I'll tell you what he said. It was very, very uh, telling about the nature of Washington. Anyway, so the war on terror bad name, not the truth. We're never going to defeat terror, you know? We're just not going to, it's not going to happen. But we need to look at what the real threats are. Now, global competition versus global conflict. We are in a huge conflict right now with the Chinese, right? I mean, my goodness, we, they're, they, you know, half the stuff I'm wearing right now is probably made in China, half the stuff we're using. 
It, it is what it is. But the, the question becomes, what happens 10 years from now when fuel is short, when we're running short on rare uh, earth minerals, uh, all the things which we need to drive a 21st century society. That's where things could change. So one of the things you all, I hope, would understand is that when you go through this, we look at systems as systems, culture. Now, this goes back to Abel Danger. Abel Danger was groundbreaking by the fact we were looking at, dare I say it, the mosque network. Oh, my God, religion. We were looking at religious organizations. One of the biggest secrets about the Islamic faith, it is not a religion. It's a, it's a, it's a political movement. It's a governance system that they do have a religious aspect to it. So when, you talk, when they talk about Sharia law, that's not compatible with the Constitution. So what we were doing at the time, which was, again, very radical and at the time was top secret, was we were looking at their social constructs, how they were doing things. Networks versus bureaucracies. Their networks were very effective by the fact they were hidden, hidden in a place we don't like looking, the mosque system. That's the truth. Anwar Alalaki, you all probably have heard of him. He's the radical cleric now in, in Yemen. Uh, a good friend of mine, Catherine Herridge, uh, the, the terror pixie on Fox News, the little brunette, uh, wrote a book recently called, Al called uh, The Next Wave. And she talks about Anwar Alalaki because he was here before 9-11. He actually moved some of the hijackers around, actually physically moved them around because these hijackers, the 9-11 hijackers, didn't speak English. He did. He was born here. So when you look at the culture and the networks, it's important to understand the truth for the truth. If they're doing terrorist activities and it's hidden in a religion, it's in our interest to look at what's going on, right? I, I, I'm the first to amend the First Amendment. I, I, absolutely, I am. I'm thinking about becoming a Druid, as a matter of fact. You know, I mean, that's ultimate. That's a joke. That's a joke. Just to see if you're still awake. Anyway, so the idea here is you need to look at what the truth is. An intelligence officer's job ultimately is to discern the truth, not what is politically expedient or what is politi politically correct. So what, is, what does victory mean? We talked about the Cold War. We won. What does victory mean in the 21st century? What does it mean? Does it mean that we will be able to defend our shores against uh, uh, foreign enemies? I, I'd like to believe so. But what about cyberspace? We were talking, uh, David and I were talking about cyberspace. Um, one of the, I, I get called in by some very exotic organizations I don't want to talk about uh, being taped, but I got called in right after the uh, Wall Street hack. Now you might recall, but few, several, several, I think four, three or four months ago, Wall Street got hacked. It was in all the papers, but the government just want to talk about who did it. I'll, take, I'll talk about who did it. The Chinese did it. And we don't want to talk about it. You know why we don't want to talk about it? Because we can't stop it. So what we have here is an issue which we don't know what to do about because we're so far behind. We focused on Afghanistan and Iraq so long, we're, we're totally like unable to deal with the realities that are now facing us. And keep in mind that everything we do now is somehow internet-based. Nine trillion dollars a day. Nine trillion dollars a day go, flows through the internet. Think about that. Nine trillion dollars, and that's the, that's the blood of the world. And we don't know how to keep it flowing. So, Michelle Rhee uh, uh, talked, I, I don't know if you remember who no, she is. She was the chancellor of schools under Ad, uh, Mayor uh, Finty in DC. Good guy, I, I like them both. Don't know them, I, I like them. She went in and started talking about changing standards so that we knew what was going on, that speaking po truth to power. She started firing people who weren't performing. Imagine that. Think about it. So she did that, but she, and she got fired eventually because people got really upset. Oh, we don't, you know, we don't like this because you're treating people badly. Well, gee, did you think maybe these people who are treating my student badly because they're not actually educating anybody? So this goes back to that issue, the truth. Um, measures of performance versus measures of effectiveness. I was actually thinking about this a few days ago when I was thinking about how we're gonna, I was gonna do the lecture tonight. When we look at military, what, what percentage do you believe, and I'm just gonna throw this out there, what percentage of people, out of 100% being everybody, what percentage of, of people in the military get a, a a 80 to, to 90 to 100 degree, who's all rated in that scheme? Who, who gets like a B plus or better? 
Everybody. Right? Everybody. You'd think we'd be kicking everybody's butt in Afghanistan, then, right? Think about it. Think about it. So think about the disconnect here. Everybody is getting high ratings. Everybody's doing really well, but we're not, we're not winning. Think about that. Think, just think about that for a second. Where everybody's rated very well. Everybody's getting B pluses to A's. They're getting medals. They're getting promoted, but we're not winning. Where is there, you know, same thing that she was doing with the school system. Everybody's getting these high ratings. Everybody's getting high evaluations, bonuses, but kids aren't learning. See, there's a parallel here. We need to be able to discern what the truth is so that we can then make decisions adequate for the benefit of our kids, right? This is about our kids. Not to quote the president, you know, I'm sorry. I know he says it a lot about, you know, the, our future generations, but it's really true. So what do we do? How do we go about judging what's best? Measures of performance versus, versus effectiveness. Um, 27th of July, I was in a hearing on Afghanistan. And I'm going to go into Afghanistan now. We were, I was asked to talk to touch about that a little bit. Um, General uh, Keene, former chief of staff of the Army, but vice chief of staff of the Army was there testifying, four-star general. I actually saw him recently in the Fox Green Room on 9-11, the anniversary. And he said, this is, and I, I, this is incredible, he said, in July of this year, we have broken the back of the Taliban. The Taliban's momentum has been stopped by us. They are no longer a military organization, can no longer launch attacks. That's what he said. He, under oath, I was there. Now, within a week of that, the Taliban attacks Kabul. Yeah, so what's going on? Now, I do believe General Keene's an honorable man. But there's a disconnect. Now, and as I've said this, for those of you who see me on the air, I'm not anti-war. I'm anti-stupidity. <laughs> the idea here is that you need to figure out a way to win. And you know, one of the things they've done re regarding this issue of performance versus uh, effect, everybody keeps looking at Vietnam. We didn't do well in Vietnam. So why are we looking at how we, you know, for the, I do a lot, you know, as a spy, former spy, we do a lot of really exotic things. One of those things is we drive fast and shoot guns out of cars. We really do train to do that. Really, they have a training course for that. And one of the things we, I'm serious, we do. We really do. We shoot through windshield everything. It's really cool. Anyway, um, we, I'm, I'm not joking. We really do. And um, one of the things they teach you in this, this, this high-speed driving class, wherever you're driving, whatever you're looking at, that's where the car is going to go. So the same thing applies in real life to this situation. If you're looking at Vietnam, that's where you're going. I say in my book, at the, in The Path to Victory, look at how we won World War II. How did we win? There were certain things we did that actually benefited us. Now, first, one of the lessons about World War II versus today is, first off, you know, um, when we did the surge a couple years ago, uh, people leaked where the troops were going. They were only going to five provinces, and they were going in, you know, on timelines. Could you imagine if we did that with the Germans during Normandy? Yeah, we're, we're coming into Normandy, and we're going to be, you know, here's the timeline. So are you taking notes? So what, why, what are we doing? Why, <laughs> why are we telling the enemy what we're doing? So that helped right there, in my judgment, ensure we weren't going to win that surge because they know where we were coming. They know we're going to be only in five provinces. And oh, by the way, there's a time limit we're leaving in two years. Right? Now wait us out. But what I drives me crazy is when senior officers actually say we're making progress. Well, you know, they, they, they can't launch military operations. Really? That, that thing in Kabul looked like it was a military operation. Well, they got lucky once. And it happens again in two months. Well, they got lucky twice. What's up with that? So there are real threats. And, 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 and the next wave is coming. Al, Anwar al alaki represents the next wave of threat. He was born here. He was born in New Mexico. Now, one of the things, you're going to find this very peculiar. He agrees with General Keene. He thinks we should stay in Afghanistan. Why? Why would an al-Qaeda terrorist think we should stay in Afghanistan? Because we ain't laying a glove on al-Qaeda if we're duking it out with a 10th century adversary. Think about it. The Taliban are Pashtun. Pashtun have been there for a thousand years. They'll be there for another thousand years. 
20 million Pashtuns sit the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan. They don't see a border. So why we, you know, so while we slug it out trying to determine which tribe wins, by the way, the Karzai tribe, along with the Northern Alliance, or another tribe, and by the way, they're corrupt. Ryan Crocker, the current ambassador, called the Karzai government a second, a second insurgency. That means we're, we're trapped. We're between two enemies. We're between the Taliban and the Karzai government. Let's talk about that for a second. Do, everybody keeps talking about defending the Afghan constitution. We, we all, they're, 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 they're a democracy. I don't know, I didn't re, I, maybe I missed it in our democracy, but does it say in our democracy that you can tell your wife to do anything you want, anytime you want? Because that's what it says in the Afghan constitution. That's right. See, see, there you go. See, women can tell men what to do here, not the other way around. Think about it. But think about it. And it's actually, so, so we're defending, we're defending that constitution. That's what we are. Every time they talk about, well, we're defending a democracy. Really, we're defending the right of a man to subjugate a woman. Is that our values? Is, is, is that what we stand for? I don't think so. So when you, when you hear these stories, about this idea, we've got to be there, we've got to help this democracy. They're not really a democracy. Let me tell you the sad story about police departments there. There's all this progress. Oh, yes, we're, we're building up the forces. Something called patronage. You all know what patronage is? You go to a village there, and they're, they're going to have on their books, and they'll show you nicely written in, in all these names, a hundred men on, that are police officers on that police force. Do you know how many really exist? Probably ten because the money coming in for that hundred goes into the pocket of that chief. You know where that money goes? To his boss. It goes up the chain. Patronage. Graft. But, you know what? That's the way they, that's, their, that's doing business there. They don't see it as graft. They say it's like it's the way we do business. So their basic fundamental framework is, inimic is inimical to ours. And oh, let me tell you something else about the reality there. Less than, less than 90% of the population can read or write any language. Any language. And oh, by the way, they can't even count. They can't enumerate. They, can't, they, they literally have to take off their shoes to count to 20. We're, this is not a 21st century democracy here. So my, one of my points, we're going to get to it here in a bit, is that the real issue is not Afghanistan, never was. It's Pakistan. Pakistan has something called nuclear weapons. People always get upset with the way I pronounce nuclear. I do it like George Bush, so, you know. Nuclear. So anyway, that's the issue. There's one of three countries, Dave and I were talking about this earlier, there's one of three countries which have nuclear weapons, which, by the way, they might, I work on a, a nuclear weapons task force. Well, obviously, I can't go into all the details, but, uh, and I sit on something called the U.S. Nuclear Strategy Forum, so we, we debate this when we look at threats. A legitimate threat to our country are three countries that have nuclear weapons. North Korea, the Pakistanis, because they, you know, they do have nuclear weapons. And you know, I, I know that it, that may be a bit hard to understand at this point because they don't really officially have nuclear weapons, but you know, the, the Iranians are, are coming up. As a matter of fact, I'll be in New York. My next stop after Colorado is New York City during the Ahmadinejad visit. I'm sitting on a panel to talk about the Iranian nuclear threat. Uh, so these are the things we have to consider. Now, uh, the, the Russians are another source of, of weapons. Uh, they do have a lot of small nukes, and, and eventually I think it's inevitable that someone's going to be stupid enough or greedy enough to sell someone a bad guy a nuclear weapon. That's a threat. That's a credible threat. So when you think about the trillion dollars we spend in Afghanistan slugging it out with what essentially has become a resistance movement, is that really making us any safer? Because Anwar al awlaki thinks this is a good idea because it's bleeding us, because it's keeping us focused on tribes that can't touch us. They really can't. While al-Qaeda is able to do all sorts of other mischief. All right? So it's not, you know, and this is where I've spent a lot of time, you probably are familiar with Grover Norquist. All right, I've had lunch several times with Grover on this issue. And it's like, you know, it's not... <laughs> to be a conservative 
and say you're against Afghanistan is not, a, Ann Coulter, I've had a, I had a conversation with Ann Coulter a while back. Ann and I agree on Afghanistan. This is silly. There are other threats out there we need to be worrying about. Afghanistan is not one of them. Now, uh, I, as much as it pains me, because I've been there, if you read my book, I talk about the fact when I went out on missions, we used to hire little kids to be our quote unquote bodyguards to help us go around and shop. I would always have a little girl. And does it worry me about the Afghan women being subjugated? Absolutely. But it, you know, it's up to them. It's up to them to figure out how to throw off the yokes of this idiocy. Remember, you all remember when the French came in and helped us settle the West? You know, they came in and helped advise us on how to get rid of the Indians? Of course they didn't. We did it. The American public moved West. We settled the West. We didn't get help from someone. So the Afghan people want this bad enough, they got to figure out a way to do it. And we, we'll advise and assist them, but it's not our job. So, um, let's see here. Uh, let's talk about Afghanistan and, what, and just about some of the more details of my book. We'll talk a little bit about my book and what went wrong. How I come to the conclusion of what we're talking about. Um, I was at, on in something called leadership targeting. Leadership targeting was a euphemism for, you know, the people who go out and try to basically kill or capture these guys. That was, that was our job. And um, we were doing things, and, and by the way, this lecture I'm giving you was giving it, given at the War College twice. And I always got gasps with this slide because it talks about, where is it here? Inside Pakistan, that's forbidden. We shouldn't be there. Oh my goodness. Well, we were, and we knew. And the old principle, the Civil War principle, ride to the sound of the fire. Bad guys were in Pakistan. They were no longer in Afghanistan. So what we were doing, and Darkheart, for those of you who have read it, would understand, it's all about the fact that we recognized in 03, 2003, if we were going to do anything to stabilize the region, we have to get the safe havens in Pakistan. Now, uh, I, I know General Tony Zinni. General Zinni is an honorable man. One of the things he's, he's made clear to me, he's, he's pounded in my head because I got it wrong once. The kids who have fought this war are honorable. Everything they've done is honorable. They are great. The, you know, they are great, wonderful uh, kids. The problem is we've put them in a situation where they can't possibly win. If you send them into Afghanistan, they can't possibly win because the safe havens are in Pakistan. And the enemy will always be able to rebuild himself. It's like having a cancer. And President Obama even said this. Uh, the issue is Pakistan. The issue is Pakistan. I don't know how many times I've heard that. If the issue is Pakistan, why are we wasting our time in Afghanistan? Think about it. Why? Well, because we can. Because we can be there. Why are we, why are we in Libya but not in Syria? Yeah, you know, same, same thing. Population is being threatened. So think about that. So, effects-based operations. What is the effect of what we're doing? How effective is it? Are we having an effect? Are we doing something? Now, deception is something that people have to understand works both ways. Deception, counter-deception. Uh, one of the things about this war is propaganda, a form of deception. So the Taliban are great at deception. And I, I, I always I ask this of my students when I teach this class, would Patton would Patton be successful today? Could he have made the leap from conventional warfare where you got guys facing each other in a line to this third dimension or fourth dimension of warfare, the information space? I think he could have. We've, we've, we've learned these lessons before as a society. Uh, Sun Tzu talked about this. Uh, all warfare is based on deception, really. Now, the enemy is really good about deceiving us. They, they, you know, they want us. Again, this goes back to Anwar al -Awlaki. They want us to be stuck in Afghanistan because we're not, we're not hitting them other places then. How are we doing today? Uh, I, I throw this in here because this is, again, going back to my comment, we want to look how we won, not how we lost. We don't want to look how we lost Vietnam. We're going to look how we won Viet World War II. Do you, who knows who said this? The truth needs a bodyguard of lies. Very good, Churchill. That's right. And he said it when he was briefed on something called uh, Operation Bodyguard. It's a great book out. Uh, 800 pages. I'm trying to get through it right now about Operation Bodyguard. Now, what, what does this have to do with today? Well, it has to do with the fact that people were thinking clearly back in the day. 
that these folks were thinking. They were trying to figure out the culture, the personalities, and the methods the adversary was using to deceive them, to make them do things against their interest. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, during, during World War II, we had the issue of, of Normandy, of, of the Normandy invasion, June 6, 1944. And, and, and for, you know, I do believe they were the greatest generation. My goodness, what, what, what? And, you know, and, you know we look at it back now, it's like, oh, they, they, had it, they had it in the bag. They didn't have it in the bag. People were, you know, we could have lost that war. So these folks were really rolling the dice and betting high, and, they, and it came out good. So this, the whole idea here was that we, we knew it was going to be tough to get back on the continent. So we wanted to do everything we could to make the Germans think something different than what we were doing. Right? So the three main goals were very, very simple. Uh, to make the Germans think we were going to Pas de Calais, that we were going there, and then also to keep them in doubt of the t date and time of the, you know, again, all the things we didn't do for our search in Afghanistan, right? We just told them, oh, we're going to these five provinces. We're going to be here on this date. We'll, we'll see you there. <laughs> Look forward to seeing you. Be there, aloha. So we didn't, you know, polar opposite. Well, we don't, we want to fool them. We don't want to tell them. We want to keep them guessing. And oh, by the way, even when we're on the shore, <laughs> We want to keep them guessing even when we're there. We want to do the Jedi mind trick on them to make sure they don't know what we're doing. Was it successful? What was the effect? The effect was the beginning of the end for the Germans. Again, they thought it through. They were bold. They understood the culture. So this goes back to my original point about what is the threat we're facing now? Is it terror? It's not terror. So this, they, they understood the culture, they understood what they were dealing with. So when you see General Clapper up there talking about the, the Muslim Brotherhood being a secular organization, it's like, excuse me? Muslim Brotherhood is not a secular organization. They are, you know, in this global caliphate to defeat us. They want, you know, they want, like, like you know, that we, have, we talk about innovations for peace, they want peace too, but their peace when they say peace, and they say it all the time, we are a religion of peace, their version of religion of peace is we're subjugated and they rule us. I mean, this is, they don't hide it. If you read their doctrine, you know, so again, I'm, I, I'm just trying to say I'm not anti-Muslim. I'm just saying the culture of which we're dealing with is a political one. So when you look at these threats, what are we doing? Are we looking at what is actually out there versus what we want to see? So, let's see, what am I doing here? We have tended to put some really great concepts together over the years. One of them is called effects-based operations. And, um, you know, the Pentagon, they're always trying to inv invent new things. And, 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 and they, I love this slide because it's uh, new concepts and capabilities. It's all new. Uh, we did rapid aerospace domination in World War II. We, the only thing new on this chart are, are cyber war and uh, rapid, rapid halt, which is essentially rapid, rapid response to things. Everything else has always happened. So we, again, need to be better about what we're doing. I'm not going to run you through that. They, they come up with all these definitions of what, what we should be doing what, what, versus what we should be doing. So we have learned as a country what is important. We have. We've been down this path before. Uh, we did this during the Cold War. So what I'm, I'm proposing here is we get a little bit smarter in how we deal, deal with things. Desert Storm, another war, a little bit closer to today. A good friend of mine, Jack Spencer, ran the deception program for this. And the reason I'm bringing this up again is what's the truth versus what's the reality and how do we deal with the adversary? <clears throat> um, Saddam Hussein, this is the first Gulf War. Saddam Hussein was a very bright guy. And one of the things we learned early on was he loved CNN. He just believed everything that, that was on CNN. He did. And I'm a, I'll, I'll tell you a story. I'm going, going, I'm going somewhere with that. So what we had to do is figure out how do we deal with Saddam Hussein? You know, we, let's try to understand him. So one of the first things you do when you look at an adversary leadership network is how do they handle information? 
How do they bring it in? What do they really believe? Well, he believes CNN, and I'll get to that in a second. So we started doing things to actually enhance our ability to, to control what he saw. One of the things we recognized during the first Gulf War is that any time airplanes took off, all of his air defense radars would come up before airplanes got there. It's like, ah, he's got spies on the ground. So we'd clear out the villages. Um, we, would actually, we actually had a spy working on his staff that told us what he was doing. So we actually had cut good inside information on what he was thinking. When the, when the battle actually started, when the air campaign started in 91, they actually did a good job of degrading, not eliminating all of the information sources he had. We, we degraded it. So we, we, we knew what he could see and we controlled what he saw. So, uh, shell game, uh, the, the, the great play where Schwarzkopf took all the units out. He, we knew, for example, that he'd been trained by the, so the Soviets in their doctrine regarding radio intercepts, signals intelligence for those who understand the military side. So what we did is like, um, we know he's going to be looking for us to set up our networks wherever we're going to attack. So we set up all the networks near the, near the shore and then everybody moved out to the desert in radio silence. So we hid in plain sight. He didn't know we were there. That's why Schwarzkopf was able to go around. Again, understanding how he was trained, how he would deploy, and using it against him. So active use of intelligence methods as enablers. We are trying to use intelligence, the truth, to facilitate our use of combat power, limited combat power. Well, what's the results? It worked. Now, a uh, little note regarding the truth. Um, I mentioned to you that he believed, huh, he believed everything on CNN. So one of the things that the that Central Command did the night before the ground invasion, just kind of just to, to, to reinforce the point one last time, um, General Schwarzkopf got up in front of the podium and, and said, you know, we're, it's almost time. I can't tell you when, but we're going to invade very soon. And someone accidentally, and again, this is on CNN, someone accidentally left up a map behind Schwarzkopf showing where we were attacking. What a, oh my God, how, how stupid could we be? Well, it showed us going where we weren't going, reinforcing one last time what Saddam Hussein wanted to think. And of course, the rest is history. Now, by the way, CNN tried to sue on that. It's like, hey, you, you deceived us. Like, um, no one forced you to film that. Right? Uh, you didn't have to film it. We didn't say film, you know. So, again, 21st century, information warfare. Are we really, and again, that's why when you talk about information, the truth is so important. It's so vital to the decision-making process. So, um, this is more stuff. So, back to Afghanistan in 03. We, uh, my job there, and again, you can look this up, and uh, as, as David mentioned, I retired from the reserves for thir after 30 and a half years. Uh, Congr uh, Congressman Walter Jones did a tribute to me. It's online. Uh, it's been posted, uh, talking a little bit of everything I did. And um, my Afghan experience is listed there. If you want to read more about it, obviously, it's my book, Operation Dark Heart. Dark Heart covers the tipping point. That is to say, that we went from winning to losing, when we really lost track of why we were doing what we were doing there. And, and, and more about that in a second. <clears throat> Afghanistan is the 41st, 41st largest country in the world, actually larger than Iraq. When I was there in 03, we were winning. And you know how many troops we had? 10,500. One eighth. No, strike that. One twelfth of what we have now, because if you count the contractors, it's closer to 200,000. Why were we winning? I'll tell you about that in a second. Not much there in Afghanistan. I, I don't know. Do, do, do we really want to fight for sheepskins and lambskins? Is that, is that important? I mean, it is. I mean, I love jackets, but you know. Well, uh, heroin. Yeah. So what we did, and I'm not going to go through all this because it, it would put you guys to sleep. We did something called effects-based operations where we looked at everything we were doing. We had to maximize everything we were doing. With 10,500 troops, Man, you, you gotta you gotta make every decision with precision. I like that. Every decision with precision. You gotta do it because you don't have any slack. You have nothing back there behind you. So what we did was we looked at the enemy. We did what I just talked about regarding bodyguard and 
Saddam Hussein, first Gulf War, looked at the enemy, looked at what he's doing, studied him, understood that, you know, if you're really going to prosecute this guy, this effort, you got to go into Afghan, to Pakistan because that's where they're at. So this is what we did. We figured out how, where they were going to go. And, and I'm going to say some things which may upset you, but I'm going to tell you what the truth is. We wanted to separate the principles, the, 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 the ideas of these guys from, the, you know, from what they were doing because they were corrupt. These guys aren't, not, aren't good guys. They send these people off to death, death all the time. Create chaos and confusion. One of the principles in Dark Heart was for us to go into their safe havens and to not put a too fine a point on it, cut people's throats at night and then leave evidence to make it look like some other tribe did it, to make them fight each other, right? If you're, if you're worried about waking up the next morning because you think Omar down the hall may cut your throat, you're going to be a lot less likely to be planning operations in the country next to you, right? That's the whole idea, Operation Dark Heart. It came to me, for those of you who haven't read the book, it, the, the whole concept of Dark Heart came to me when I was watching Apocalypse Now. The horror. The horror. And the idea was, man, you know, if, if, if you can intimidate those guys, if you can make them worry, then they're going to be a lot less able to come back in an insurgency. Right? And that was the idea. That's dark heart. And again, so I, I just so I'm clear here, so you guys, when you read the books, like, well, it doesn't show we could have won the war. No, I'm not saying we, we could have won the war. I'm saying dark heart was meant to buy us more time to affect them at a very fundamental level. Fear. They understand fear. Again, we, you, we all as Americans have this great... We are benevolent people. We are. They aren't. They, were, they, they understand two things very basically. They understand revenge, and they understand fear, intimidation. Now, you might ask yourself, why were we being so effective in, in, 2000, in, 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 in 2003 with um, 10,500 troops? Reason being is because we were there on for vengeance. We were wronged. Most of these folks understood that we were hit on 9-11 and we had the right to be there. So we were there to do business and that's why we were left alone to do what was necessary. So with that said then, we were able to do what we had to to actually achieve what we needed to, to, to maintain stability. The country was not fixed, but they weren't coming after us. And the tribes didn't mind us being there because they were tribes. They've always hated each other. So the idea here is that when you go through this, one of the thing, principles is, is, is that we had to be the most badass tribe on the ground. And if you read my Path to Victory, I talk about the fact that we need to get back to being the, the most badass tribe. When I was there, they had one suicide bombing the entire year. You know who they attacked? The Germans, NATO. Why? Because the perception was you can hit NATO. They won't do anything to fight back. You hit the Americans, they're going to hit back. Perception. So, the whole idea here is mortal fear. We're a military organization. That's what we do. We can do that. So, for every action, there's an opposite reaction. Uh, this is actually an Air Force concept. Uh, it's a decision-making process. Try to figure out how your adversary observes orients, decides, and acts. And when you think about it, that's what we all really do every day, right? I mean, you, you, we all observe. We get up in the morning, we turn on the Today Show or whatever, we observe. Uh, we figure out what orientation we have to do. I have to go to work, so you have to do that. You decide to do it. You implement your decision, and then you act. This is, this is fundamental. This is done by an Air Force pilot. And, and, and frankly, this is the way systems really do work. So what we need to do is understand our adversary better, to get inside of his loop, to, to intimidate. And again, it's, it's, this, is not, this is not about uh, being good or bad. It's just about being real, of understanding what the real threat is. So what we did, what, what we did and what Dark Heart is about as a book, is that we were looking at the, Pac the, the Pakistani safe havens in 03. Now think about that. We're in 2011, 03. We knew what was militarily necessary to achieve victory in 03. But we chose not to do it. Political decision. 
Now, I'll talk about why that decision was made, and, I, I, and you can judge for yourself whether it was good or bad. Um, we understood their command and control. We understood how they were getting logistics. We understood their, their, their social infrastructure. It goes back to my original point regarding Able Danger, the terrorism project we were tracking Al-Qaeda. They function, uh, their command and control is within their culture. Families. The Haqqani network, family. The Hekmadiyar network, brothers, sisters, tribes, family. That's the way they fight. So we understood that. Uh, and we were actually ready to do some very aggressive things, as I just pointed out to you. We started implementing the operation. We started targeting these things. Uh, I can't go into everything. You know, some, as you all saw the book, it was heavily redacted. They don't like talking about some of this stuff. Not that I think it's classified. I think it's more embarrassing than anything else. Because this was a concept which we felt very strongly that could have bought us more time. Now, uh, when you look through it, the perceptions changed. There were two general officers who made a great difference. And this goes back to the politics. Um, Lieutenant General Vines was the commander of forces when I was there. And, and he'd get up in the morning, and he would always joke about, uh, during the morning briefing, he'd say, where's the border today? Where is it at? Because the idea was, we're going to go over the border as much as we can, because that's where the enemy's at. He was very aggressive. He was a war-fighting general. He, he got it. And he approved Dark Heart. If you read the book, again, you, I, I, I paint the scene very clearly where he approved the operation. But the idea was, we wanted to do what was military appropriate to, to continue to win. And um, he developed a health problem, had to be evacuated, and left. Well, his relief came in, General Barno. General Barno comes in. And he has a completely different attitude. Now, I go in and brief him on what I've just talked to you about, the concept of dark heart, the idea of going into Pakistan to intimidate, cajole, and as best we can eliminate the safe havens, make it so that they can't come back into the country to buy us more time. And his answer to me was, um, you might get caught. Uh, yeah, probably not. We've been doing this, you know, you know, a couple of ten, tens of years, and we're pretty good at it. Well, you know, the Pakistanis need to pull their own weight. Uh, they're on the other side, General. They're not on our side. Well, you don't know that. Yeah, I do, we do know that because we rolled up a female Pakistani ISI operative in a raid that the, she was with the Taliban on, so we know that. Well, that's one example. Eh, we've got more than that. So the whole idea was here that one general made this, a decision that, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to do counterinsurgency. We're going to make them like us. Let's, let's make this a better place. Uh, you know, uh, the British tried that twice and uh, didn't work out well for them. Well, we don't care. We're smarter. I don't know if we're about that. Well, the Soviets tried that too. And by the way, just for you, uh, you, you've studied the history, we're doing the exact same thing the Soviets did. We focused on the, 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 the urban centers, secure them, same thing the Soviets did, and, and I just don't see it ending any better for us at this point. So the consequence here was this. We took our eye off the ball. The issue was really Pakistan, right? That's where the nuclear weapons are. That's where the bad guys are. Ah, oh, but we, we can stay in that. We can, we can do whatever we want in Afghanistan because we're here. Oh, that's a good reason to do combat operations because we can, we can be here. So that's the point here. Uh, 2003, and I, this is an old briefing, by the way. I mean, this is, I, I'm, I left this in there for a reason. 2008, we were at 30,000 troops. Now we're at 120 by real accounts. We're officially about 100, but 120 by the folks I'm talking to. We went from 10,500 and winning to over 100,000 and getting our, our butt kicked. Two-star commander to a four-star commander with huge layers. You can't get any, I mean, you can't swing a dead cat without hitting a general officer in Kabul. And I'm not joking about that. I'm really. I've seen those dead cats. And popular perception. Why are we getting beat up now? Because we're the occupiers. We've been painted, going back to the truth, being in this information war, that the Taliban have been able to paint us as occupiers. Oh, they want to take your land and keep it. Do, do, does it, do, any, of one, do any one of you, do any one of you really believe we want to take and hold Afghanistan forever? Do we want their land? 
You, you all know that, but the Taliban have convinced the Afghans that's what we're doing. That's why we are now the occupiers. We lost that battle of the narrative. And we saw it coming. We saw it coming. We knew that this is what they were going to do. So, and oh, by the way, Iraq turned out to be a great training ground for these guys to get all this experience doing IEDs because that's what they're doing to us now. What went wrong? A lot. Um, unity of command or there, lack thereof. Um, one of the principles during World War II, even as big an army as General Eisenhower had, unity of command, unity of effort. We turn it over to NATO. Here you go, NATO. Good luck with this. Go ahead. Do you all, counter drug is a big issue over there. You know, the poppy crops. Um, do you know how many DEA agents were in Afghanistan when I was there in 03? Anyone want to guess? Two. Bingo. And they couldn't leave the American embassy. Seriously. So there, there was our counter drug effort. The rationale was, well, you know, they got to make money somehow, so we'll, we'll just let them do the crop thing. It's like, are you nuts? The Taliban are going to make money off that. Well, you know, we just, well, they, can, they didn't make money somehow. So that was a huge, and then, do you know who they put in charge of crop eradication? You all, you all have heard of Delta Force, right? Well, the British equivalent of that is Special Air Service. They put the Special Air Service in charge of crop eradication. Can you imagine Delta Force? Our, our guys, you know, these guys are trained to go in and take buildings out, trying to do crop eradication. So we didn't take things seriously. And then we're, now we're looking back on it, it's like, gee, I guess we should have done something different. Yeah, we could have. And then everybody says, oh, God, I wish we would have known, we would have known better. They did. We, we did. We chose to not do the right thing. Uh, Afghan National Army versus Afghan Militia Forces. You know how long it took to secure Afghanistan in uh, 2002? 2001, 2002. 42 days. You know how we did that? Afghan militia forces. Tribes. Warlords, dare I say. Why now are they fighting us? Because they don't like us. Because we're the ones trying to force them to go to the Karzai government. Because we're forcing them into this 21st century construct of a central government. Let me tell you something, for you all, and I hope you all remember this. The Afghan people aren't ungoverned, they're self-governed. How much more time do I have? Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Okay. I do want to open up the questions. So let me, let me hit this real quick regarding the Afghan people. Let me tell you what level we're missing. This goes back to the truth and trying to figure out the culture. Uh, farmer, and, and by the way, this is based... What I'm telling you is in a Christian Science Monitor article, so you can look it up on the internet. A, a farmer in Kandahar, frustrated with the government because his neighbor keeps trying to take his land. And it's been his land for generations, and he feels this is wrong. So he goes to the government, and he bribes the government official, saying, would you please tell my neighbor to give my land back? Yeah, yeah, how much money you got? He take, the, the government official takes money, takes over $300. The average Afghan makes about $40 a year. So this is huge money for him. And you know what happens? Nothing. The government doesn't do anything. So he finally gets frustrated, and he goes to the only honest guys he can find, the Taliban. Seriously, I'm, I'm not joking. So he goes to the Taliban and says, hey, um, my neighbor is treating me badly. He's taken my land. And so they say, oh, we'll take care of this. We'll put together a sure. We'll put together a tribal council, and we'll decide. So he goes to the government to get the land records, the land records are there, takes them to the Taliban, and they have this three-person council, and they sit down, they go through it, and they make their decision. It's like, you, you my son, you are, you are correct. And so they go to the neighbor who is wrong, and they, they tell him, you are now wrong, we're telling you you're wrong, and you know what, if you, if you don't abide by our decision, you're going to hell. And he believed it. That's the level of their understanding. They, he understood that these religious men, who were part of the relig their, their, that shadow government, has said, you're going, if you don't do what we tell you, you're going to hell. He believes it. It seems like a pretty simple solution to me. So we're completely missing out of understanding the culture we're dealing with. So my point to you tonight 
is that we've got to understand the adversary for what they really are. Is a farmer in Kandahar who believes that if a, a, a religious leader tells him he's going to hell can affect his life, is that, or do we not get it? I don't think we get it because that's the level they're operating on. So, let's see here. So, it goes back to my original point about performance. Keep in mind over the past 10 years, people have performed very well. They've gone, they've gotten great report cards, they've gotten medals, they've gotten promoted. But what's, what's the effect? Are we winning? No. Because we could become so focused on a process and it's easier to manage the process than achieve victory. It's a huge disconnect. This is what we, you all, should be vocal about regarding our political leadership and our military leadership. Uh, and so let's go to the, the current threats. Let's see here. Oh, here we go. So, what do we do? There's a, there's a, a host of things out there that we all need to be concerned about regarding threats, regarding integrity of the intelligence process. If, you, if it quacks like a duck, it walks like a duck, it's probably a mallard. You know, I mean, it, it's something like a duck. That's what you should be demanding of the intelligence community. The truth. It's not too much, it's not too grand a thing to ask for. Really, I mean, the truth. That's what you pay intelligence officers for. Right? That's what your tax money... I, I, when I ran operations, there was two fundamental rules I used to use to judge if I was doing right. Uh, one rule was the uh, Ed Bradley rule. I met Ed Bradley before he died. If, if Ed Bradley had showed up on my doorstep with a camera crew asking what I was doing, could I tell the truth and still come out looking good? Would that operation make sense to you all? That was one of my, you know, if it, you know. And my second point, and please don't take this the wrong way, is the Joe Sixpack rule. Uh, would, would Joe Sixpack, living in Minard, North Dakota, who's having a hard time paying his rent, would he plop money down to, to support me doing the operation? Did it make sense? Would he pay for it? You all should demand this. Right? I mean, this is the thing. Is it, is it, is it, is it politically, is it, does it pass the smell test? And would you, would you take money out of your wallet and give it to me to do something? Right? That's what our focus should be. So, leads me to my, my last topic of the night, Impact America. There are real things we have to be concerned about. Um, there's natu natural and man-made e electromagnetic pulse events. Now, I, I don't want to get too scientific because we've been talking about strategy and concepts tonight. And this is one of those things that, that my think tank and I work, also work, work with EMP, with Impact America on. Electromagnetic pulse in natural form is coronal mass ejections, uh, sunspots. And these things can, can be small or large. Uh, how many of you knew over um, Valentine's Day this year, parts of the Chinese telecommunication infrastructure went down because of a coronal mass ejection? Y'all, anybody know that? Part of it went down because of they got hit, and that was a, a fairly small one. If we if we hit had a major sunspot hit, we could lose parts of our power grid for a good amount of time. Uh, Man-made starfish prime. Y'all, anybody here starfish prime before? 1962, 1 1.2 megaton blast over the Pacific, high altitude, took out all sorts of power grids and satellites. What few we had back in 62. Man-made. Our adversaries know that that's, uh, that, that that's available to them. The Iranians and the North Koreans are both working on EMP weapons, which could take out the entire power grid of both coasts. They could put a, a, um, a barge off the coast, shoot a rocket up, and take out our power grid. And we'd be down for months. Oh, yeah, we'd get them back, but we, large parts of the population would not have power for a long time. And as I mentioned earlier, we depend everything we do now on the Internet in some form. So... Right now, one of my things, and I do work on a lot of defense issues, is trying to help get 668, the SHIELD Act, passed. And the idea is, now, you've all seen literally billions of dollars spent on our so-called shovel-ready jobs programs within our economy. Yet there's things that we're not doing, and one of those is we're not hardening the power grid. 
Can you imagine us trying to survive without power for any amount of time? It's not, it's not possible. Uh, I was on CNN a while back and I talked about what would, what would Manhattan be like if you didn't have power or cars for 30 days and you had no way to bring food in? What would you do for water? Think about it. So these are things that we just decided not to fund when we funded all these other work projects. So this is something we're actually pushing for. Uh, personal preparedness. I actually do a, a blog on, on, on the website. Talk, I might be doing a series of things talking about personal preparedness. Uh, no matter, even if we get HR 668 passed, every individual has a certain responsibility to do their own thing to be able to survive for a week or two. And I, I talk about that a little bit. Believe it or not, I had a Jack Bauer moment uh, two weeks ago where the White House actually called me down to talk about this. So I actually got to go into the White House, believe it or not, as much as, I'm, you know, some people over there don't like me. And um, the path forward, you know, we've got to look at these things realistically. There are real threats. Uh, one of the reasons we're, Impact America is doing the talk on Friday, we're having a panel, uh, Lieutenant General uh, Tom McInerney and I are going to be on it together, uh, talking about what we need to look at regarding future threats. And the Iranians do have a potential of being a real threat. I'm not trying to be alarmist, I'm just saying that there's evidence there that these guys don't like us, and not only do they not like us, they don't think like us. They don't think in a rational way. Uh, we're actually going to exercise some stuff uh, in October. National Defense University is having Secure Grid 2011, and for the first time ever, they're going to have a full, transparent, private sector, government media event, because you probably all know most of our power grid is owned by the private sector. The government doesn't own it. But, we, but they depend on it. So we're actually doing an exercise to talk about uh, how, how we're going to respond to it. So that's going to be something you guys can look at in the, in the media. And of course, the path forward. Uh, we're trying to push hard on, on the, the SHIELD Act. And hardening, and this is a stat I've been told, I believe it's true, if we harden 10% of the infrastructure against coronal mass ejections or an attack, we will hasten a recovery by 40%. We will bring things more quickly back. So it's something to think about. And just think about all the little things you depend upon. And then in regard, one of the things you guys can do, the FBI has actually got a program which they do public outreach regarding protecting the infrastructure called InfraGuard. I've actually joined. And it actually is a very good, you can meet local FBI agents and you set up a network for survival locally. So uh, this is all very important stuff. Now, um, if you want more information on this, we can always expand on this next time. Um, but this is something obviously that, that, that when we talk about threat, if we talk about telling the truth, this is all scientific. This is not sci-fi. Uh, the EMP Commission a few years ago determined that these things are something we have to be concerned about. And so when you look at the big scheme of things, and this goes back to my point originally, we have to look at issues which relate to protecting our future and our kids' future by telling the truth, by hiring people like me, hopefully, you know, that maybe are not as outspoken as me, but uh, who are able to get the, 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 the difficult jobs of discerning threat, of doing what's necessary to protect our infrastructure against future things, future threats, to, to actually do the right thing. And this is all for you guys. This is all for the American public. And I, and I, I don't, I don't want to sound melancholy or, or, or overblown here, but you've got to have people looking out for your best interest in Washington. We don't always do that. So this is where you all can play a huge role by making sure that you all demand of your government good governance. Now, speaking the truth. So anyway, um, I think that's all I've got. I just uh, I wanted, again, kind of go through things tonight with you guys relating to my experience regarding Afghanistan, regarding my book, to tie the concepts of accountability with performance and to, to help you give you guys an understanding that there are real threats we have to look at. There are real 21st century things we have to do. We have to call things for what they are. And as we work them, we have to look at the threats that are developing, which could actually do damage to us. So that's my uh, spiel, so. I like your idea of creating more mortal fear. <laughs> and I think the Russians did that pretty well uh, with the Somali pirates. They did. Remember what they did? They caught them, they handcuffed them to the ship, and then blew up the ship. Well, that seemed to work out pretty well. It does send a message. Thank you. You believe in that, probably. Well, I, the, the answer, the, the, basically, the concept I said, Dark Heart was not a gentle operation. It was not kinder and gentler. The idea was to use mortal fear as a basic intimidating factor to, to slow down their ability to, to mount an insurgency. 
in your opinion, what should we do in Afghanistan? Should we just get out? Yes. Right now. And I would leave 20,000. Let me make this point very clear. I, again, I'm not anti-war. I'm anti-stupidity. Slugging it out with a bunch of folks who um, can't read or write will not make us any safer as a nation. What we need to do is understand the dynamic of that region. The real issues here are the India-Pakistan Cold War. The reason the, the, the Pakistanis use the Haqqani network, we all saw the Haqqani network in action last couple weeks. The Haqqani network is a proxy of the, of the, Irani, of the, uh, of the, uh, um, the Islamabad government. They are part of the, IS, the ISI, which is the uh, Interagency Intelligence Services, the Pakistanis. The reason? Because they use the Akhani network to hit Indian targets. The Indians are trying to, quote, unquote, be helpful in Afghanistan. They build power plants. They do things. They're not being helpful. They're trying to actually kind of wedge in, you know, between uh, them and uh, the PACs. That's what they're worried about. So we need to look at the regional dynamics as a strategy rather, you know, this is a chess game, this is not checkers, and we continue to play checkers in a chess game. So the answer is, not, I'm not saying we should leave, we should leave in mass. we should not have 100,000 troops slugging it out with the resistance, we should be one of the tribes and be the most badass tribe so that the message is this, you can live however you want, we really don't care, the moment you threaten us, we're going to kick your ass. I mean, that's, that's just kind of, that's, that I, it may sound simplistic, but that's, that's the way I see it. Looking ahead two years, your situation analysis of Iran, Iraq, Pakistan, and which one do I leave out? Uh, well, the region. I, I think that's. No, yeah. I, well, we're, we're good, it's a good question. We, we're dealing with Arab Spring right now, and um, all all Arab Spring is not created equal. Now, let, let, uh, let me explain that. Uh, Egypt, for more, for better, for worse, was kind of a freedom freedom uprising. Uh, Libya is not. I was on with Ambassador Ali Ujale, who had just defected back in Mar March 19th. We were on Fox News together when the no-fly zone started. And the ambassador was saying, oh, this is a freedom uprising. This is the people. It's like, no. And I said this on the air. It's like, I hate to dispute the ambassador. It's not. This is a civil war. And it, look at what's going on right now. There's still, quote, unquote, pockets of resistance. Those pockets of resistance are tribes which were loyal to Gaddafi and still are. So when they talk about, well, Gaddafi loyalists, no, they're tribes. If you look at the real issue, it's a, tri it's a tribe on tribe. It's much more like Bosnia than Egypt. So what, we, what we're going to see is a very complex period relating to each one of these countries. We'll, we'll have to determine how it's going it's to move forward. Uh, there was going to be an Arab Spring in Saudi Arabia. Do you know how the Saudi Arabians prevented it? They, pr they paid everybody $100,000, said, stay home. Don't come out and protest. I don't know. I'd, I'd stay home for $100,000, wouldn't you? Yeah, you know. So, but it's a, it's a ticking time bomb. And Yemen is about to fall into to Somali. It's, it's, gonna, it's about to become another Somalia because it's just so chaotic. So this, I, I can't tell you, because I don't know all the ramifications of everything in the region, but I'll say this. Uh, the, the Turkish are trending back to being a religious, or, you know, a religious country versus secular, which is not good for us, not good for the Israelis because they're very close. And I think that trend's going to continue. Uh, the, the, the one thing we've got going for us in the region is, believe it or not, the, uh, the um, um, oh my goodness, the, uh, the Kurds, thank you. The Kurds are, are, are actually kind of a stabilizing, this is going to sound strange, because they are destabilizing, they actually help stabilize the region by the fact they get the Iranians, Iraqis, and Turkish all kind of focused on them. So it's kind of a, you know, well, we all hate them. They're bad. Okay, well, good. Go focus on that. So the idea is I think there's going to be some things there which will just totally be undecided, but that's not bad. You know, chaos is not bad, as long as it's not here. Uh, Saudi Arabia, they got, some, they got some problems coming. I don't think they're going to come through this unscathed. Uh, if you look at what al-Qaeda has been doing, they've been coming up through Yemen and to, to, uh, to Saudi Arabia, so there's some problems there. The one thing I can say is this. Uh, we, as the American nation, have to understand that we have to to make decisions based on what's our interest, not on being kinder and gentler. And I know that sounds harsh. It, it, may, it may not be in, in line with the, you know, the innovations for peace, but the deal is this. We, don't have, we can't be the world's police force. And there are things we have to be concerned about. Nations with nuclear weapons that could be used against us, big concern. Uh, Yemen, you know, I, I hate the idea of people suffering. 
But, you know, they've got to figure it out for themselves. You know, we, we had to fight our way, uh, you know, to become a, the nation that we are. We should lead by example, not by intimidation, and, and at least when it comes to that. One more question on this side, and then we'll try to get over to the other side for a couple more. Um, you talk about victory and the definition of victory, and, and I'm wondering, there, there's a theory that what the U.S. has been really expert at since World War II is going into regions and create chaos to prevent any single dominant, uh, any single person for, or country from dominating that region. And I've heard an argument that in uh, Afghanistan, and in effect, or Vietnam, in effect, that's what the United States has done. It's gone and created chaos so that, for example, Al Qaeda can't use uh, Afghanistan to train and to, and to uh, develop its leadership. And I wonder if you could comment on that. Yeah, um, they're doing quite well in, Lib in uh, Yemen and Somalia and other places. So, uh, you know, the idea of, of preventing them from going into Afghanistan does not hold water to me. Um, regarding the chaos theory, uh, to be honest with you, a lot of folks I deal with believe the only people, the only nation that would benefit from a stable Afghanistan is China. Believe it or not. Because China has invested heavily. They have a copper mine there. They want to do more there. So basically, as, 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 you know, we've studied this extensively. By the way, Center for Advanced Defense Studies, you can go to our website. We have all sorts of, uh, of background documents on our research. So um, what I'm saying is that we, I don't believe that we need to have our kids fighting with the Taliban. There, there was something a while back I found incredibly sad. Now, I'll finish the question in a second. There was this probably 22-year-old kid, um, army guy, on I think it was ABC News about six months ago, and his, one of his, his buddies had just got killed. It just died, and he was standing there almost in tears saying, talking about the Afghan people, don't they understand we're the good guys? No, they don't, because we're not to them. It's not a good or bad thing. They are who they are. They are a tribal warrior race who would like to kill each other. And when a foreigner's there, they all focus on the foreigner. Now, another thing to, to your point, the Taliban do not have sufficient military mass to be able to overwhelm and take power again. Not going to happen. Would they come back? They, and the other thing, that, remember, they've already got a shadow government in place. And they can't run things now. So there's just no way that they're going to be able to sustain and extend that. And the other thing is we took our eye off Afghanistan. They were able to, you know, the wound was able to fester. So I just don't see us being, you know, don't forget that uh, uh, Clinton, Bill Clinton only fired um, cruise missiles in. We didn't send special forces teams to make sure we kill people. I don't think we're going to make that mistake again. So uh, the situation is different now. I don't see Afghanistan as something we have to slug it out to win. The victory we need to achieve is achieving the, st the stability in as much as that we need to be able to determine uh, where the nuclear weapons are, who has control of them, and make sure they never fall into the wrong hands. That, to me, is victory. If they, if they go on slugging it out with each other, the chaos theory, that's fine, but it's not us. Yes? What are the biggest threats that we face from China, and what do you think we need to do with them? Good question. We talked about this about dinner. Um, China is right now a global competitor. Within the next 10 to 20 years, we're talking about huge resource issues. Uh, fossil fuel, uh, they're right now in Africa. One of the big things, you guys can look it up on our center page. We've been studying their efforts in Africa. They've been going out, uh, doing all sorts of, of, of infrastructure upgrades in Africa for resources. So right now, they're a global competitor. Uh, and I think that'll continue for a while because they, they, they own so much of our debt, so they don't want to lose that. But there'll be a point in time of diminishing returns where holding our debt versus intimidating us for natural resources is going to become an issue. It's going to become the same thing during World War II with the Japanese. The Japanese, it came to a point in time where we were cutting off the Japanese resources and they got upset. Well, we're going to have a similar thing probably 10, 15, 20 years from now. With that said, People are not accounting for the huge social problems within China. Uh, despite what Joe Biden says, that well, we, we, we don't want to criticize your uh, one-child rule. Look, it's a bad idea because, yes, for, for both freedom's sake, and think of this, and I'm not saying this to be mean, all, everybody wants a male child. And think about how that destabilizes the, you know, I, I don't know, I kind of like girls. You know, don't, don't, don't ask, don't tell went away today. But I still like girls, you know, I, and the idea is, I do, really, seriously. I'm, I'm married to one. So, um, 
the idea is, is that you have a population imbalance. You're going to have so many males and none of females. That's going to create huge social problems. And not only that, they are still communists. All this profit, uh, all the people making money, do you know where they bank? They bank with the, the, bank, the, the, the Chinese bank. Well, what's our choice? Well, you have the Bank of China or the Bank of China? Or the Bank of China. But it's, uh, so they know that they're kind of, you know, the people are getting kind of a bad deal. It's like, how come I can only invest with you? Well, we, we know better than you what you're, you know, we, we know. So there's all sorts of internal problems which have not been, you know, really looked at. This is a big debate in the Pentagon right now. A lot of this basically, uh, those of us who think that China is going to have its own problems to not really focus on, on them now as a military issue versus a bunch of folks who want to build a bunch of aircraft carriers and, and start and, you know, trying to intimidate them. It's like, now's not the time. Ten years from now, maybe, now's not the time. Plus, we don't have the money. So I do think that we, they, they do have the potential to become a huge adversary, but not now. There, there's too many things we're working with them on. And frankly, they've got their own problems they're going to have to deal with within the next 10, 20 years. Can I have a question, sir? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, you've done a pretty good job of uh, uh, identifying threats, <coughs> etc. cetera, uh, and that being the critical part of any action. Uh, I'm, I'm not an American citizen, so when I visit your country, I accept the rules as they are, or I don't come. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's fair. It's fair. That's reason. My wife is an American citizen, and yet to travel around within the United States, she and I, and she in particular because she's got more metal in her than Titanic, get subject to the enhanced down, mm -hmm. which anywhere other than in the United States airport would be regarded as a sexual assault. And the perpetrator would be immediately arrested and thrown into bloody jail. Now, can you tell me or explain to me how they identify the same security I'm talking about? Right. They, how do they identify the threat? Right. Seems to me they're not doing a very good job of it. Can someone check his green card? No, I'm just kidding. It's a joke. <laughs> no, I'm just, no, no, I'm just um, You're absolutely correct. Um, let me say this, you may, may not like my perspective on this, uh, it, it, it is all show to make people feel safer. Exactly. It, it doesn't make you any safer. Right, right, no. Now, let me, and, and by the way, I have a quick story on this. Last time I came through, I had to go, which area? I was in some airport, and I was wearing just a one, just a uh, wool shirt, one piece kind of wool action shirt. And I went through one of these new body scanners, it's supposed to, oh, it detects everything. And I go through, and, and I get through, and the guy says, excuse me, sir, are you wearing anything under your shirt? It's like, no, my breasts. I mean, that's it. Well, the, the, the system showed something. Really? I'm not wearing anything. You know, I said, well, can we, can we touch you? You go right ahead and knock yourself out. And so they, they actually felt, you know, and I, I do work out. I do, you know, as... as we were talking, we were joking over dinner, uh, Don Rumsfeld now knows I do pull-ups with 25 pounds on me as I do it, so it's another story. Anyway, um, and I do, and it's like, well, and, and they go back behind the little screen in there, it's like, hey, there's nothing on it. Well, go check again. <laughs> Can we check again? I haven't moved, I go ahead, I mean. So I, that's supposed to be cutting edge technology. I have my doubts, right? I mean, you know, I'm, Gee, I didn't know I was that big-breasted or a threat. <laughs> so it's all show because what you're, you're dealing with here is that 99.999% of the traveling public are not terrorists. I'm not a terrorist. Don Rumsfeld got stopped a while back. He's not a terrorist. Yeah. Well, okay. I know. <laughs> if you all saw my interview on O'Reilly, you know how I feel about him, so I won't get into that. Um, but um, with that said, this is, we need to do what the Israelis do. You know, there's certain alerting behaviors. I was with a friend of mine a while back, and uh, I, this, is, this is telling stories, I shouldn't do this. He, he did something where he, he saw someone out of the corner of their eye, and it, it, just a brief second, I, I, I could tell he knew him. And we get into the restaurant, and it's like, you know that person. How did you know that? Alerting behavior. But I barely, I said, yeah, I know. So that's the thing we should be looking at, alerting behavior, right? And, and we're not doing that because I'm sure your wife is not a threat. I don't know you, but I'm pretty sure you're not a threat, right? Right? Well, there you go. So, so the idea here is we need, again, to speak the truth of what the issue is. The issue is 
we, we, most of the public is not. And, and I, I do find it totally seven-year-old kids. I mean, come on. You know, I, I, don't, I don't get it. Babies. Yeah. So, there, again, there's threat profiles and, uh, dare I say, data mining. I mean, let me tell you something. There's a vast amount of information available on any one of you that they could just kind of bring up. But they choose not to do that. Why not? Look at some, you know, yeah, and so they're not doing things which are smart. So this is something, and a good friend of mine, Bob Harding, you know, Bob Harding was up for the TSA job a few, few, uh, few years ago. He didn't get it because um, hearing his things went wrong. And I know Bob, I, he's a black general, I, just great guy. Um, and uh, he would have done a lot of things to change the way they think because he's an out-of-the-box guy. And um, they didn't want him. They, they put all sorts of pressure to make him kind of step down and not through because he would have adapted the Israeli model of, of, of screening. And think about this for a second. Do you know how much money your government's or our government's invested in the, this technology? Well, it cost me too because I have to pay for that drill. That's right. Billions of dollars. So there's a whole cottage industry now set up around this quote unquote enhanced security. Instead of doing what, you know, a basic psychological screening would do everything you need to for a fraction of the cost. So again, as my friend Jerry Doyle always says, a radio guy, the, 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 the benefit is in the medicine, not on the cure. And so the cure here would be to going to, do, to practical security measures, not this technology stuff. So. Don't forget your Trent Lott story. Oh, oh let me do my Trent. request from the audience for you to tell the Trent Lott Trent Lott story. Okay, real quick. This goes back to my original premise about the truth. So anyway, um, I was talking to, to Dave in the drive. It's like, you know, I spent most of my, my career undercover. So the last thing I ever thought, and you know, sometimes I'm sitting there getting ready to do a, a, an interview at Fox News when I got the Capitol in my back and I'm sitting there, it's like, man, this is a strange place for a spy to end, end up, you know. Anyway, so back five years ago when I first was asked, just so you know this, this is important to understand, the reason I went public wasn't because uh, I wanted to. I'll be honest with you. It wasn't, I didn't break my cover. Speaker of the House, Denny Hastert, personally asked me to help get to the bottom of the able danger thing, personally. Now, um, with that said, once I broke cover, uh, I was sitting in the Fox Green Room in Washington, D.C., kind of overwhelmed. You know, this lieutenant colonel spy sitting there, uh, just a stranger in a strange land. And in the Green Room, Across from me, and, and I'd already gone public and I was doing an interview, right across from me in the green room was Senator Trent Lott. Senator Trent Lott was sitting there and he was on his book tour, and you all know he went through some pretty rough times too during the time he was there. And um, he looks over at me and says, uh, Colonel Schaefer. And I'm just, sir, I'm just shocked he knew my name. It's like, uh, well, uh, Colonel Schaefer, um, I've been watching you in the media. You've been doing a, a good job. I, you know, well, thank you, sir. He says, but if you don't mind, I've got would you mind if I offer you some advice? No, no, Senator, go right ahead. He said, well, there's just two things I, I want to share with you, uh, but, you know, I, I think they'll help you. It's like, okay, great. He says, well, the first thing you've already learned, and I, and I said, what's that? He says, well, it's never good to be right ahead of your time in this town. <laughs> I, I said, I got that. He says, yeah, I know you got that one. I know you got that one. He said, the next one, though, you're going to have to think about, but you'll come to figure it out. And this is it. Whatever they're talking about publicly, the real issue is something else entirely. So that was Trent Lott's advice to me, the two words of advice. Whatever they're talking about publicly, the real issue is something else entirely. So those lessons I've never forgotten, and uh, it's the truth. So again, you know, I appreciate the fact that you all are interested in the world and what's best for us. You know, you guys... You can put pressure on politicians. You can do things. You have it in, within your, your ability. So I appreciate you all being here tonight, and I appreciate you uh, having me to speak with you. So thank you. Thank you.